Hello, hello, and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. I am here today to do a Friday Reads video where I wrap up the week in reading and talk about any bookish things that have been going on or just anything I really feel about talking about. I finished three books this week, one in the month of January, two after February began, and I'm really looking forward to talking about them, but we will discuss those three books when we get into the Friday Reads portion of this, of this video, as well as some of my reading plans coming up. Uh, the first thing I want to mention is I uh, just want to post a link to a bookstore t-shirt because I know a lot of you love um, my bookstore t-shirts. And actually, uh, this Read Books, Drink Coffee, Fight Evil came from a bookstore called Flint Hills in Council Grove. And I have never actually been to that store, but I have had developed a relationship with the owner on Instagram, as has Joel. She's just a lovely lady. And she released a new design for a t-shirt. I'll put it up here. And Joel and I immediately ordered it because we just love it. So I'll put a link to the bonfire campaign where you can do that if you want. Just I know everybody loves my t-shirts and I love this store. So I wanted to mention that as well. Um, and I'm also going to put a link down below because um, if, if you remember, Montana Book Company is doing renovations for their store. They're remodeling the inside. Uh, so it, it's looking really good so far. But they have a GoFundMe as well uh, if you have any uh, amount of money that you would like to uh, spare to help. Um, I'll have a link to their GoFundMe down below as well. Just, you know, bookstore updates because we love independent bookstores. We want them to be around. So there's that. The next thing I want to mention before I get into the actual Friday Reads portion of this video, just really quickly, is that Joel and I have started watching The 1619 Project on Hulu. This is an outgrowth of the original 1619 Project, which was a series of articles in the New York Times. I believe it was in their Sunday magazine, uh, pr produced by Nicole Hannah-Jones. And they, in tandem, uh, produced an educational component to that, so it could be taught in schools. That formed the basis of the attacks against uh, critical race theory being taught in schools because um, people didn't want any children or uh, college-age students to be taught about the history of slavery in this country, essentially, and it's it, it's a shame. So we purchased a copy of the book, knowing that I will get around to reading it at some point, um, but we really purchased a copy of the book to support her because at a certain point there was a um, conservative person who tried to encourage people to buy his book to knock her off of the bestseller list. And it, it's just, it's been a lot. She also produced the book out of that. It did a children's book in, as a companion to that. And now there is a TV show as well, which is based on some of the essays that are in this book. The episode that we just watched last night is about... Um, voting rights and uh, race boxes. It, it, I know it's based on an essay that's in here. I'm trying to see if I can find it really quickly on the fly. And it's not really working out for me right now. Uh, here it is. Race by Dorothy Roberts. I believe that was the one that was the um, foundation for the episode that we watched last night. So it is sort of an outgrowth of the book as well. It is produced by the New York Times and Nicole Hannah-Jones. And we've only watched two episodes so far. I believe four of them are available. And it is an astonishing show. Uh, we can only emotionally watch one episode per night. So that's why we've only done two. But that actually works because uh, it helps us you know, stretch them out a little bit so that as they become available, we can follow along. We're not binging our way through them. I don't think it's something you can binge because it's very emotional. The second episode deals with... Um, identifications and classifications of race and how they were created and why they're important in this country. And one of the frameworks around that is a couple who couldn't get married because they did not want, they did not think it was right that to get a marriage license, they had to identify their race on the form. They did not have an option to opt out. You had to do it. So, and then there's also a lot of talk about healthcare for black women and why it is worse for them than it is for other people in this country. It's really fascinating. I would encourage you to watch it. I think it's important. I think it's perfect watching for Black History Month. And it is... I, I never lost the urgency to read the 1619 Project. The only reason I didn't get to it last year was that I, I knew that it would stress me out and make me angry. And the TV show is doing that. But I think with the place I'm at right now, emotionally, it feels like a clarifying rage and not like an overwhelming 
one, if that makes any sense. So I do really want to get to this book at some point. I feel like I, I this is something that I would actually do on audio. So I've got myself on the hold list again on Libby. And I'm looking forward to it. But I would absolutely recommend the TV show to you. It is on Hulu in the United States. And uh, I, I would say it is urgent viewing, especially during Black History Month. That covers everything before we get to the actual Friday Reads portion of this video. So let's just dive into that because there's a lot to talk about on that front as well. I finished three books, as I said, and I have my first five-star fiction books of 2023. I've mentioned I don't really like to think about books in terms of their star rating, and in, especially as, as I talk about them on the channel and things like that. But I, I do think it's interesting in the context of like the first five-star reads of the year, uh, and uh, especially since the first two five-star reads were nonfiction, which I don't read as much of as fiction, I tend to be much more passionate about fiction and, and literature in general. So it was just a little bit surprising. But this week I got not one, but two five-star fiction books, and we'll talk about both of them. The first one I want to talk about is Summer by Edith Wharton. I decided to read this book very last minute because it was inspired by one of the other books that I finished this week, which is His Family by Ernest Poole. And the impetus for it is that I have been working on a Pulitzer Prize project for his family. This is the first book that won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction, which at the time was the Pulitzer Prize for the novel. And one of the things I like to do is look at other things that were published the same year. And when I was looking, I saw that a couple of other things that were published the same year are available on audio, on Scribd. One of them is Summer by Edith Wharton. And I started with this one because it was not a very long book. It's a novella. And it is different from a lot of Edith Wharton's other novels because it is not set in New York City. It is set in New England. And I really loved this book a lot. It is the story of a woman named Charity Royale. She, as I said, lives in New England. She has been sort of adopted. She has guardians, uh, who the Royales, who took her down from the mountain. It, in this town where she lives, um, the mountain is where the poor people live. And it's coming from the mountain is seen as something that is shameful. So she has been grown up to be taught that she should be ashamed of where she comes from, although she's not really ashamed. It's, that's something that really makes her a fierce and independent and uh, sort of out-of-the-box thinker. Um, she's not necessarily ashamed, but she understands that she should be ashamed of where she comes from. She understands that she should be grateful to her guardians for getting her away from that. And uh, it, it's an interesting dynamic. So her female guardian, Mrs. Royale, has passed away. We never meet her. She's, she's already dead by the time the book begins. And this has put Charity in a very precarious situation because over the course of this novella, she is sort of men either use her and abuse her or attempt to use her and abuse her. And one of the things that happens early in the book is that her essentially father, uh, Mr. Royale, or her adoptive father or her guardian, um, comes on to her in the night and she has to set a boundary between them and say, and say like, this isn't going to happen. And then a dashing young man named Lucius Harney comes to town and the two of them begin to engage in a relationship. She is certainly unlike a lot of the other women that uh, Lucius Harney has met. She is like this fiery spirit. She's kind of uncompromising. She is unapologetic about who she is in a lot of ways, even when she is being ignorant about something or wrong or even a little mean spirited. And she is unapologetic about where she comes from. She knows that he, she acknowledges that she is from the mountain. And um, it, Lucius does begin a sexual relationship with her. And it's about her role as a woman and how she is left torn, like, sort of tossed to the side and used and abused by these men. I don't really want to get into a spoiler territory for where the story goes, but that that's sort of the setup for it. And... It's a really well done book. It's interesting, and it will be interesting to incorporate into discussion of his family when I do my deep dive on that book, because it is a book that, I mean, clearly Edith Wharton is someone who was seen as in contention for a Pulitzer Prize 
because just two, maybe three years later, she won a Pulitzer Prize for The Age of Innocence. So she is one of the early winners of the prize. And that is not far removed from his family becoming the first by, by any stretch of the imagination. So clearly she is an author who was uh, popular enough to be in the conversation. But it's easy to see how Summer would have been sort of pushed out of that conversation. It is even I think on the Wikipedia page, it refers to it as one of Edith Wharton's lesser known works because it is her most controversial work, because it has the, the sort of audacity to talk about a woman's role in society and the ways in which men can use and abuse her and uh, talk about a sexual awakening for that young woman. And it's easy to see then that Summer probably would never have been in contention for the Pulitzer Prize for fiction, but I am really glad that uh, Edith Wharton ended up in the mix just about three years later. I'm trying to think of them. So his family was first, followed by the Magnificent Ambersons, and then there was a year where there was no winner, so three years later is when Age of Innocence did win. Sorry, I had to work that out in my head. But I I'm really glad that I read this book. I've always wanted to read more Edith Wharton. I did read The Age of Innocence a couple of years ago before I decided to do this Pulitzer Prize project where I'm trying to read every book that has won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction, which was originally called the Pulitzer Prize for the novel, and that is the era in that we are in with his family and Summer. And I've always wanted to read more. I had kind of, in my head, thought that House of Mirth would be the next book that I would get to by her. Clearly, that is not the way things worked out, because now it's been a couple of years and I haven't gotten to the House of Mirth. Uh, and I will be rereading The Age of Innocence for my Pulitzer Prize project. Uh, but I am really glad that I fit Summer in. It's, I would absolutely say it's a five-star read. I loved it. it. It's just, Edith Wharton is a brilliant writer. And if you haven't tried her work, I would absolutely recommend her. I've only read two, to be fair, but Age of Innocence and Summer are pretty powerful, I would say. So we got to a good start in the week, and then the next book that I finished was actually His Family by Ernest Poole. And again, this is something that I am reading as part of my Pulitzer Prize project. It is the first winner of the Pulitzer Prize for fiction, which again was the Pulitzer Prize for the novel at the time. And I'm still going to be coy about what I thought of this book. Um, in the past, as I've been reading books for my Pulitzer Prize project, I have pretty openly discussed what I was thinking of them in my Friday Reads video. For whatever reason, I just feel like being, uh, holding my cards a little close to my chest this time. Um, just, I don't know, an amusement for myself more than anything. Nobody cares, but <laughs> it's just for me. Um, so I'm going to hold on discussing my feelings of this book until I do my Pulitzer Prize deep dive, which I am going to hold a little bit longer because there are um, two or three other books that were published in 1917 that are available on audio, on Scribd, so I would like to read them before I do my deep dive just to help myself get a sense of what is out there uh, in that publishing year for a more full discussion of uh, what what the, that year was like for readers uh, and for critics. If you are unfamiliar, Ernest Poole is... So he had been a celebrated author for a book that he published two years before earlier, uh, which was before the Pulitzer Prize uh, existed and was offering awards. His family is a sort of uh, domestic drama. It's about a man who is... Uh, getting ready to turn 60 and it's interesting time at that point it's as if he's getting ready to die <laughs> because he's going to be 60 um and he has three daughters his wife has died uh a couple of years earlier and uh he is doesn't understand his daughters he doesn't really understand the world around him because it has changed so much since he was young so it's sort of a domestic drama about him trying to understand his daughters and forge a relationship with them and understand the world around him. And it will be a really interesting book to talk about as part of my Pulitzer Prize project. So stay tuned for that. But just to give you an overview of what it is about, because I don't want to not talk about it at all, but uh, I will hold my impressions of the book uh, until I do the project a little bit. The final book that I finished, before we move into what is next or would potentially be up next was The Gunkle by Stephen Rowley. And I just finished this book this morning and I, I, I just, I can't help smiling when I think about this book because I loved it so much. This is the other five-star read uh, for fiction and I just loved this book. I admit 
when I heard about this book, I, I did think, oh, that sounds interesting. I might read it, read that at some point, but I didn't I immediately prioritize it. I guess I made assumptions about how fluffy this book might be. Part of that is the title, part of that is the cover, part of that is even the description of the book, which is that um, it follows a man named Patrick who has been an actor. He was on a popular sitcom and uh, got a lot of uh, acclaim for it. He won a Golden Globe for his uh, part on the show. It's It almost sounds like a Friends-ish sort of show. Um, but now the show has been over for a couple of years and he has retreated to his home in Palm Springs where he kind of leads a quiet life out of the spotlight and seems very happy doing that. There is a, a bit of a problem when uh, his brother, whose name is Greg, gotta love that name, um, his, his brother Greg's wife dies and his wife, Sarah, had originally been Patrick's friend. Um, that is how Greg and Sarah met. They met because Patrick was friends with Sarah. And uh, so he has lost a dear friend. He's lost a sister-in-law. And Greg reveals to him uh, that he has become dependent on painkillers while his wife was ill and dying. And he needs to go to rehab. And he asks Patrick if he will take care of his two kids, Maisie, who is nine, and Grant, who is six. So Patrick finds himself with two kids in his home in Palm Springs, and he does not have a lifestyle that really involves children. But one of the things I really liked about it is that it does, this isn't setting him up to be someone who's incompetent. Like he's actually good with the kids from the beginning. And he is, it's not that he's unwilling to take them. He knows it's a responsibility. He knows that his brother really needs help and he's happy to take the kids. Um, so th it, it, it evolves any of that sort of cliched setup. Uh, he, Patrick is very willing. He's good with the kids and he might not think he's good with the kids, but you know, we as the reader can see like, oh, he, he's actually like the perfect person for this. Um, and it's just a really sweet book in that regard. And they're all, they're, they're navigating grief. Um, Patrick is sort of doubly navigating grief because he had uh, had a partner. They weren't married, uh, but they were more than just boyfriends, essentially. And years earlier, uh, that man, Joe, died in a car accident. And Joe uh, Patrick was in the car with him. So uh, he has a scar on his face from the accident and... Uh, he kind of struggles with it because no one really understands why that he essentially lost a spouse as well. Uh, like one of, he has a bit of anger with his sister because when Joe died, uh, her response was, well, at least you weren't married as if that's supposed to be comforting. And nobody really, really understands, uh, just how devastated he is about this. And he, for the last few years has kind of wondered how he's supposed to go on in the world without this person who was so important to him. And now he's lost someone else who was important to him. She was essentially his best friend. And he shares this grief with the kids and they essentially understand each other. And, you know, this for me is sort of like a secret, uh, secret life of Albert Entwistle type book by Matt Cain. And if you follow along, you know that that was one of my favorite reads from last year. The reason it was so, important to me was that uh, it came about not long after we had lost our dog Guinness last year uh, which is something that we're Joel and I and Jamie are still uh, sort of working through the grieving process on that and that book really kind of tapped into that and the fact that the characters in the Gungle are also really really reeling from grief and trying to find ways to live on and honor the memory of who they have lost and carry them with them um it meant a lot, and I'm not going to get emotional. <laughs> I'm not going to get emotional. Um, but it's a really sweet book, and it deals with some really serious issues. So I think the marketing leans into it being fluffy, and it is a funny book. Uh, it doesn't feel like a heavy or a dense book by any stretch of the imagination, but it, it definitely does not feel fluffy to me either, and I, I just, I really loved it. I would say this is now one of my favorite books. And I don't apologize for that. I just, I really loved it. And I feel bad that it took so much to get me to actually prioritize reading this book. Um, because when I saw it and when I heard people talk about how much they enjoyed it um, and how surprised they were that they enjoyed it, despite the, the marketing being so fluffy, um, 
I didn't take it seriously. I still didn't <laughs> take it seriously. And it's just a, a really tender book. And I, I loved it. So I'm, it will be in my heart for a long time. Um, and I, I, let's leave it at that because I don't want to get, <laughs> I just finished it, uh, this morning and I'm clearly emotional thinking about it, but I'm really glad that I read it. So let's just leave that and, uh, talk instead about what I might be doing next because for February I have a lot of plans and I, I, Joel and I actually filmed our February wrap up yesterday. So I'm filming this on Friday. We filmed our wrap up Thursday and I'm going to edit both this video and our wrap up today. You'll get my Friday reads on Saturday as usual. And then, uh, if you're watching this, the day it posts tomorrow, uh, Sunday, you will get our January reading wrap up and our February plans. So I don't want, I, I don't want to spoil anything for that, but I'm kind of torn about what I want to do next because there is a bonus prompt for the EM Forster read along to read short stories of EM Forster this month. And I happened, I, I did have a hold on his stories at my local library, or at least this, this same collection of them, The Life to Come, which includes some that were not published during his lifetime uh, because they dealt with homosexual themes or elements. Um, and it hadn't come in. I actually just got a notification that it actually, it is available. Um, but I found this at my local used bookstore for a dollar. So I grabbed it. So part of me feels like I should do this next because it is something that I'm supposed to do for February, uh, as part of the read along. And I'll have a link to a video with information about the EM Forster read along down below. Um, so I think this is going to be my next book in my next physical book because I finished his family, which was the physical book I was reading. So I, I, I need another one. Um, but I also have an e-galley on NetGalley that is stories and I might do that. So I haven't really decided. I think the one on NetGalley uh, is called Games and Rituals. It's by Catherine Heine. And I think it would be a quick read. So I'm very tempted to read that one first and then get to the life to come. But we'll see. I haven't made up my mind yet. Um, so it's my next physical book will be one of those two books. And I just don't really know which. Now, in other news, I had been thinking that I might try to cram in one of those 1917 books that's available on audio. Um before I get to Fingersmith by Sarah Waters, because this is the first title for the 2023 Queer TBR Tackle. And again, I will have a video down below with information about that if you would like to follow along. But our first book up is uh, one a book that had been on my TBR, uh, Fingersmith by Sarah Waters. And I decided I want to do the audio, even though I have a copy of the book, because I the only Sarah Waters book I have read is The Paying Guests, and I listened to that on audio, and the audio production was just fantastic. So because of that, I feel like I want to do Fingersmith on audio as well. So this will probably actually be my next audio. I think I'll hold the 1917 ones until I'm done with Fingersmith, which is a pretty chunky book, and since I'm supposed to read it in February, I feel like I'll get through this before I do any kind of like a bonus prompt. Um for uh, it's a prompt. I'm saying prompt, but it's any kind of a bonus for my Pulitzer Prize project. Um, so this will probably be my next audio. And um, I'm deciding what I'm going to read for Black History Month because I want to get something in during the month of February to cover that. Um, I have a hold on the 1619 Project's audio on Libby, but it's going to be weeks before that becomes available. So it won't be that. Uh, the Montana Book Company's 2023 Reading Challenge has a prompt for to read a book by Bell Hooks. And I looked on Scribd, and the audio for Ain't I a Woman is on Scribd. So I think once I am done with Fingersmith... I'll either fit in bell hooks or I will um, jump to one of those 19, 1917 books. Uh, there's an Edna Ferber that I'm really looking forward to. So uh, yeah, that, so I, I, that's probably what I will, will do. Um, there had been a couple of people made a case for a different book by bell hooks. Uh, it's just that that's the one that's available on audio. So we'll see how that goes. But anyway, that is, I think that covers everything for what I have uh, read, loved, and or wanted to talk about in general. Um, if you're watching the 1619 Project, let me know in the comment section down below and let me know what you have been reading, what you have planned for February and uh, 
all that stuff in the comment section down below. I'm going to leave it at that for right now and just say, as always, I really appreciate your time. And as always, I will be back until next time. Happy reading.